Chapter One of A Slave Is a Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenever. A Slave Is a Slave by H. Beam Piper. Chapter One. There has always been strong sympathy for the poor, meek, downtrodden slave. The kindly man, oppressed by cruel and overbearing masters, could it possibly have been misplaced? Jurgen, Prince Trevanion, accepted the coffee cup and lifted it to his lips, then lowered it. These Navy robots always poured coffee too hot. Spacemen must have collapsium-lined throats. With the other hand he punched a button on the robot's keyboard and received a lighted cigarette. Turning, he placed the cup on the command desk in front of him and looked about. The tension was relaxing in battle control, the purposeful pandemonium of the last three hours dying rapidly. Officers of both sexes, in red and blue and yellow and green coveralls, were rising from seats, leaving their stations, gathering in groups. Laughter, a trifle loud. He realized suddenly that they had been worried, and wondered if he should not have been a little so himself. No, there would have been nothing he could have done about anything, so worry would not have been useful. He lifted the cup again and sipped cautiously. "'That's everything we can do now,' the man beside him said. "'Now we just sit and wait for the next move.' Like all the others, Line Commodore Van Schatrak wore shipboard battle dress. His coveralls were black, splashed on breast and between shoulders with the gold insignia of his rank. His head was completely bald and almost spherical, a beak-like nose carried down the curve of his brow, and the straight lines of mouth and chin chopped under it enhanced rather than spoiled the effect. He was getting coffee. He gulped it at once. It was very smart work, Commodore. I never saw a landing operation go so smoothly. Too smooth, Shatrak said. I don't trust it. He looked suspiciously up at the row of viewscreens. It was absolutely unnecessary. That was young Obrey, Count Erkskull, seated at the Commodore's left. He was a generation younger than Prince Trevanion, as Shatrak was a generation older. They were both smooth-faced. It was odd how beards went in and out of fashion with alternate generations. He had been worried, too, during the landing, but for a different reason from the others. Now he was reacting with anger. I told you from the first that it was unnecessary. You see? They weren't even able to defend themselves, let alone— His personal communication screen buzzed. He set down the coffee and flicked the switch. It was Lons Degbrand. On the books, Lons was carried as assistant to the ministerial secretary. In practice, Lons was his chess opponent, conversational foil, right hand, third eye and ear, and sometimes trigger finger. Lons was now wearing the combat coveralls of an officer of Navy landing troops. He had a steel helmet with a transplex visor shoved up, and there was a carbine slung over his shoulder. He grinned and executed an exaggeratedly military salute. He chuckled. <laughs> well, look at you. Aren't you the perfect picture of correct diplomatic dress? You know, sir, I'm afraid I am for this planet, Degbrand said. Colonel Ravney insisted on it. He says the situation downstairs is still fluid, which I take to mean that everybody is shooting at everybody. He says he has the main telecast station in the big building the locals call the Citadel. Oh, good. Get our announcement out as quickly as you can. Number five. You and Colonel Ravney can decide what interpolations are needed to fit the situation. Number five. The really tough one, Degbrand considered. I take it that by interpolations you do not mean dilutions? Oh, no. Don't water the drink. Spike it. Lons Degbrand grinned at him. Then he snapped down the visor of his helmet, unslung his carbine, and presented it. He was still standing at present arms when Trevanion blinked the screen. That still doesn't excuse a wanton and unprovoked aggression, Erskill was telling Shetrak. 
his thin face flushed and his voice quivering with indignation. We came here to help these people, not to murder them. We didn't come here to do either, Obray, he said, turning to face the younger man. We came here to annex this planet to the Galactic Empire, whether they wish it annexed or not. Commodore Shatrak used the quickest and most effective method of doing that. It would have done no good to attempt to parley with them from off-planet. You heard those telecasts of theirs. Authoritarian, Shatrak said, then mimicked pompously. Everybody is commanded to remain calm. The Mastership is taking action. The convocation of the Lord's Master is in special session. They will decide how to deal with the invaders. The administrators are directed to reassure the supervisors. The overseers will keep the workers at their tasks. Any person disobeying the orders of the Mastership will be dealt with most severely. Static, too. No spaceships into this system for the last five hundred years. The convocation equals Parliament, I assume, hasn't been in special session for two hundred and fifty. Yes, I've taken over planets with that kind of government before, Shatrak said. You can't argue with them. You just grab them by the center of authority, quick and hard. Count Erskel said nothing for a moment. He was opposed to the use of force. Force, he believed, was the last resort of incompetence. He had said so frequently enough since this operation had begun. Of course, he was absolutely right, though not in the way he meant. Only the incompetent wait until the last extremity to use force, and by then it is usually too late to use anything, even prayer. But at the same time, he was opposed to authoritarianism, except, of course, when necessary for the real good of the people. And he did not like rulers who call themselves Lord's Master. Good democratic rulers call themselves servants of the people. So he relapsed into silence and stared at the viewscreens. One, from an outside pickup on the Empress Eulalie herself, showed the surface of the planet, a hundred miles down, the continent under them curving away to a distant sun-reflecting sea. Beyond the curved horizon the black sky was spangled with unwinking stars. Fifty miles down the sun glinted from the three thousand-foot globes of the two transport cruisers Canopus and Mizar. Another screen from Mizar gave a clearer, if more circumscribed, view of the surface, Green countryside veined by rivers and wrinkled with mountains, little towns that were mere dots, a scatter of white clouds, nothing that looked like roads. There had been no native sapient race on this planet, and in the thirteen centuries since it had been colonized the Terro-human population had never completely lost the use of contragravity vehicles. In that screen, further down, the four destroyers, Irma, Irene, Isabel, and Iris were tiny twinkles. From Irene they had a magnified view of the city. On the maps, none later than eight hundred years old, it was called Zegensburg. It had been built at the time of the first colonization under the old Terran Federation. Tall buildings rising from wide interspaces of lawns and parks and gardens, and at the very center, widely separated from anything else, the mass of the citadel, a huge cylindrical tower rising from a cluster of smaller cylinders, with a broad circular landing stage above, topped by the newly raised flag of the Galactic Empire. There was a second city, a thick crescent to the south and east. The old maps placed the Zegensburg spaceport there, but not a trace of that remained. In its place was what was evidently an industrial district located where the prevailing winds would carry away the dust and smoke. There was quite a bit of both. But the surprising thing was the streets, long curved ones and shorter ones crossing at regular intervals to form blocks. He had never seen a city with streets before, and he doubted if anybody else on the Empire ships had. Long boulevards to give unobstructed passage to low-level air traffic, of course, and short winding walkways but not things like these. Pictures, of course, of native cities on planets colonized at the time of the Federation, and even very ancient ones, of cities on pre-atomic Terra. 
But these people had contragravity. The towering, wide space city beside this cross-gridded anachronism proved that. They knew so little about this planet which they had come to bring under imperial rule. It had been colonized thirteen centuries ago, during the last burst of expansion before the System States War and the disintegration of the Terran Federation, and it had been named Aditya in the fashion of the times, for some forgotten deity of some obscure and ancient polytheism. A century or so later it had seceded from or been abandoned by the Federation, then breaking up. That much they had gleaned from old Federation records still existing on Baldur. After that, darkness, lighted only by a brief flicker when more records had turned up on Morglay. Morglay was one of the sword worlds, settled by refugee rebels from the System States planets. Mostly they had been soldiers and spacemen. There had been many women with them, and many were skilled technicians, engineers, scientists. They had managed to carry off considerable equipment with them, and for three centuries they had lived in isolation, spreading over a dozen hitherto undiscovered planets. Excalibur, Tizona, Graham, Morglay, Durandal, Flamberge, Cortana, Quernbiter. The names were a roll-call of famous blades of old Terran legend. Then they had erupted, suddenly and calamitously, into what was left of the Terran Federation as the Space Vikings, carrying pillage and destruction, until the newborn empire rose to vanquish them. In the sixth century pre-empire, one of their fleets had come from Morglay to Aditya. The Adityans of that time had been near barbarians. The descendants of the original settlers had been serfs of other barbarians who had come as mercenaries in the service of one or another of the local chieftains, and had remained to loot and rule. Subjugating them had been easy. The space vikings had taken Aditya and made it their home. For several centuries there had been communication between them and their home planet. Then Morglay had become involved in one of the interplanetary dynastic wars that had begun the decadence of the space vikings, and again Aditya dropped out of history. Until this morning, when history returned in the black ships of the Galactic Empire. He stopped out the cigarette and summoned the robot to give him another. Shatrak was speaking. You see, Count Erskel, we really had to do it this way for their own good. He wouldn't have credited the Commodore with such guile. Anything was justified according to Obrey of Erskel, if done for somebody else's good. What we did, we just landed suddenly, knocked out their army, seized the center of government, before anybody could do anything. If we'd landed the way you'd wanted us to, somebody could have resisted, and the next thing we'd have had to kill about five or six thousand of them and blow down a couple of towns, and we'd have lost a lot of our own people doing it. You might say we had to do it to save them from themselves. Obrey of Erskel seemed to have doubts, but before he could articulate them, Shatrak's communication screen was calling attention to itself. The Commodore flicked the switch, and his executive officer, Captain Patrick Morville, appeared in it. We've just gotten reports, sir, that some of Ravney's people have captured a half-dozen missile-launching sites around the city. His air recon tells him that that's the lot of them. I have an officer of one of the parties that participated. You ought to hear what he has to say, sir. Very good. Van Shetrak whooshed out his breath. I don't mind admitting I was a little on edge about that. Wait till you hear what Lieutenant Cormath has to say. Marville seems to be strangling a laugh. Ready for him, Commodore? End of chapter 1